What's up, guys? I hope you're all doing well and that you had a fantastic New Year's. I am so ready for 2024. You have no idea. We are going to unleash on South Africa and the rest of the world this year. Um, I mean, I've got so many plans. And just taking a little bit of a look back at last year, last year was probably one of the most incredible years of my life, even though uploads did get a bit scarce towards the end of the year. I mean, if we look back at some of the things we accomplished with the America trip, uh, episodes like the Ellen Pucky's episode, we did a few documentaries. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, every single time I go out, I'm meeting people that watch this show. And um, it's always the most incredible interaction. I love uh, interacting with you guys. I love speaking to you guys. And I love hearing your thoughts on the show and what I can do differently and better to make things bigger uh, and build the community. With that being said, this year, I'm going to rein in on um, personal and fun things. I'm going to be focusing so much on this show because I just, I need to do this more. I love doing it. And I want to feel like I'm coming somewhere every single day and producing the best content in South Africa. Um, I'm going to diversify a little bit. I'm going to be doing some more documentaries. I'm going to be doing more commentary videos like the one I did at the end of last year, the prison one. And um, I'm also going to be experimenting with some short form content with YouTube shorts and stuff. So there's a lot to look forward to there. But anyway, when it comes to this episode, this episode was filmed right at the end of last year before New Year's. And um, it's pretty interesting. It's something very different to what I've done before. It is with ex-gangster Tando, who has been on this podcast before. His episode is mind-blowing. I would definitely go and watch it. He has a crazy story. And he, at one point in his life, was a hardcore gangster and killer. And if someone like him can turn his life around the way he did, then I truly believe that anyone can. Um, and he's an amazing individual to the, uh, today. Um, the other guest I had on was Jordan Hill Lewis, who is the mayor of Cape Town. And I really thought it would be interesting to have them on at the same time to hear their different perspectives. Um, and uh, the episode is very different. I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, it's It was a different vibe, a different energy. And um, I would love to keep doing this kind of stuff and, and get better at it as I go. But um, anyway, I explain more at the beginning of the episode. So without further ado, enjoy this week's episode. What's up, everyone? My name is Josh Rubin, and this is The Wide Awake Podcast. To my left is Tando, who is an ex-gangster, and he has actually been on the podcast before. And to my right is Jordan Hill Lewis, who is the mayor of Cape Town. <laughs> Lovely to have you here. Thank so, you. The reason I wanted both of you guys on at the same time is because I thought it'd be a really interesting perspective to have someone who is in one of the communities in Cape Town, you know, that that is ha, has suffered over the years a lot. He's from, uh, Tando's from Mitchell's Plain. Um, now he's lived in many other areas, but I thought to have a politician on, someone like you, it would be interesting to hear the perspective of someone like Tando, right, who is from the areas that that kind of need the most assistance right now. Yeah, that is me, a former gangster, former, former, a lot of things. <laughs> but right now, I'm a reformed man, I'm a born-again Christian, and I'm willing and able to serve my community. Yeah. Lovely. To start off with, I want to know, Tando, what are some of the, the biggest challenges people in your community face on a daily basis? The biggest challenges in my community is lack of policing, lack of communication, and lack of services. For instance, why I'm mentioning lack of policing is that, um, for instance, like I'm going to speak with my, or with my condition now, what is happening. My son right now is in drug addiction. So what is happening is annoying and is irritating his mom all the time, looking for money, wanting stuff. So I remember he, he stole some things at the house and he went to go sell them and we found out and the mom called the cops to come and take him away, to lock him up because he stole from the house. And she told the cops, this is my son, he's doing this and he's addicted to drugs. And the police did not come. Mm. They said they're gonna come, they did not come. And two, three days went by and the same thing happened again. And the son is again there in our doors, knocking at night, two o'clock in the morning, waking us up, wanting money to go do drugs and stuff like that. And the mom's telling, I wanna give you nothing. And she phones again the cops, telling the cops, he's here, he's annoying me, he's irritating me, come and fetch him, come and lock him up, you know? And the cops still, up until this day, they did not come. And um, the second thing is the municipality services within our community, they are not for us, you understand? First and foremost, um, I remember you mentioned, uh, I heard you on the news, you were speaking about free electricity units. 
mm. for, for, for Cape Town, you know. And at the same time, the, we as underprivileged people in Mitchell's Plain and in the townships, we used to get free electricity units, say four to five electricity units that you get. But after that, when we went to the shops to go buy electricity, we did not get any more free units, you know. And the units that were available were even less according to the money that we are paying. So now we find that we used to buy maybe 50 rand for the week electricity. Now what we happen now, we're paying now 150 for electricity for the week. And these are people without jobs. These are people who are dependent on social grants and stuff like that. So it's very hectic, you know. And the lights are out. We call the municipality to come fix the lights and nobody's showing up. You know, so we're facing those types of, 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 of issues in our community. And the utmost thing is also the communication with us as individuals and the government. We do not have that communication. So what we, our biggest issue right now is that lack of policing, lack of services and lack of information and communication. Where are you living, Tando? I'm living in Mitchell's Plain. But which part? Eastridge. East and are you living in a backyard or are you living in a house? I'm living in a house in my, in my father-in-law's house. Uh, but in the in the in the house or in, in the backyard? In a separate entrance, yeah. Okay, and your father-in-law probably is still getting the uh, the, the free units, or is or is is his house uh, value too much? He's getting the free units. He's isn't? not getting it. Anymore. Okay, so he's not no longer qualifying for indigency support. No. Okay. So I mean, I think let's narrow in on kind of like one topic, right? So like the the one thing you mentioned was policing in your areas, yeah. right? So people that. Uh, from overseas viewers. Um, so Tando is in Mitchell's Plain, which if I'm not mistaken, is like kind of part of the greater Cape Flats, right? Sure. Um, one of the things that he mentioned is like his son, um, and I recently had Ellen Puckies on, so, um, who also had, her son was an addict and she dealt with abuse her whole life. And basically she tried to get the police to intervene and it just could never happen, right? So it, nothing ever happened from it and something, um, she, she basically ended up snapping and we all know what happened. She, she murdered her son. So I think stuff like that is really important to know, right? Uh, and I want to get to the elections and stuff a little bit further down the line. But when it, when it comes to places like Mitchell's Plain, um, what is happening with policing? And how are they trying to, like the first topic I actually want to talk about is like gangs, right? What is being done with, with, with gangs? What is being done with addiction in those areas? How are they policing the crime in those areas? So just to remind you that uh, policing is, is under the control of the national government. The local government does not control the SAPS. Cool. Uh, the SAPS is under tremendous pressure and resource uh, constraints in South Africa. They don't have enough vehicles. They don't have enough officers. They don't have enough uh, uh, resources at those stations. Uh, it's, it's under huge pressure. Mm. So we are seeing them starting to crack. They're not answering 10111 anymore. They're not, they're not coming when you call them as you've uh, just explained with your own situation. Uh, so what we are actually supposed to do is what, what's called bylaw enforcement. We're supposed to do local law enforcement, traffic, uh, uh, you know, stuff happening on the street, that kind of thing. We're not actually supposed to do crime investigation or, mm. or uh, crime prevention. But increasingly across the country, local law enforcement in municipalities have had to step into what the SAPS used to be able to do, which is patrolling, mm. uh, responding to crime calls. M more often than not, when people have a crime happening at home, they call the city rather mm. than 10111. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure none of us would call 10111 right now if, if, if we were in a, a bad situation. So that's happening more and more. Uh, so we have tried to pick up the the slack left by the SAPS, and let me just say, uh, Josh, there's lots of great SAPS members. Mm. Uh, the, you know, the, they really do their best in very tough circumstances. So I'm not saying that they they're all bad, but it is a it's an organisation really struggling. We try to pick up the slack by uh, adding our own officers onto the streets, uh, particularly in Mitchell's Plain, in, in Delft, in Wallace Dean, in Nyanga, in Crossroads, mm. where you where you grew up. Uh, so we've put 1,300 extra officers into uh, 10 or 11 of the worst crime hotspots in the city. And they are making a positive difference. They are bringing down street crime. They are helping prevent violent crime. But there's certain things that they can't do. They can't respond to every crime call. Mm. Uh, they, that's, that's just not their job. Uh, 
And just to give you an idea about the difference in resources, we've got about 1,300 offices in those hotspots, including in Eastridge. Yes. And SAPS has got 28,000 offices in Cape Town. So it's the, the, the resource difference is vast. Mm. But even with one twentieth roughly of the – probably one twenty-fourth of the resources, we actually are seeing violent crime slowly – clearly not fast enough, but slowly ticking downwards in those areas where we are deploying. So we are making a, a positive difference there. We also have part of our Metro Police is a gang and drug task team, incredible people who are going and raiding drug houses, uh, investigating drug dealers, and, and trying to bring them to justice. Uh, and, and I've been out on, the, on patrol with them a couple of nights, and they, you know, they are incredibly brave and, and, and wonderful people. So we are trying where we can to bridge that divide between what SAPs should be doing and what they are actually currently capable of doing. Mm. We're trying to stand in that gap. And so you're saying this kind of falls on the ANC really because... Well, I think overall in South Africa, we the national government has neglected basic services in favor of a few bad decisions like uh, uh, going deep into debt, paying far too much for public salaries, allowing our national wage bill to get totally out of control. So two of those failures uh, present themselves in in Tando's life, the the policing failure, but also there should be state uh, drug addiction facilities available Mm. for his son. Mm. And the fact is that they are all absolutely full. There has been far too little investment in state drug addiction facilities. I'm sure that Tando would struggle to afford a private addiction Mm. uh, treatment facility. And his son needs treatment if he's going to get off uh, whatever he is addicted to. So again, there is a, a failure of investment in basic essential services uh, in preference for or uh, instead of the, the the national government has uh, invested in things like higher salaries, deeper debt, you know, greater uh, payments on that debt and so on. And when it comes to uh, gangs, right, what, why do you think people join gangs in the first place? I think overwhelmingly people join gangs, and, and I'd love to hear from your experience, Tundra, why you joined a gang. But, but they see the prospect of quick money. When, you, when you're growing up and there are few jobs around and you need to look after the family, there is a ready and willing community there that that opens their arms to you it feels like a a kind of brotherhood and uh, there's an opportunity to earn some cash Uh, now at some level you must know that this is this only has two endings really there Mm. are only two endings either prison or death and uh, at some reason you must know that but i presume it's like all humans we assume the worst is not going to happen to us right we can we can manage our way through it uh, it's going to happen to the next guy. Um, so, you know, that's that's why I think people join gangs. But but I I, I can't speak with any authority. Yeah. Yeah. I've never joined a gang. Why, why cool. did you tell us, Tando? Okay, cool. Um, I remember a question that Darius just asked me a couple of days ago because we're still busy doing a project, me and him. He asked me in 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 accordance to uh, I, I'm not delving into the apartheid thing because yeah. I'm also not about raising apartheid issues. But he told me, he asked me this question. He said. What do you think did apartheid uh, deprive you from? And I said to me, uh, apartheid never really affected me because I was born later stages of that. So even in the communities where I grew up in, I grew up in a white community, I grew up in a black community, now I'm living in a colored community. So I can say I had the best pick of all those things. So nothing really happened to me. Then he said, but um, Tando, you a sharp guy. I know I, I've spent some time with you. You could have been academically well off right now, you know, when you were still, if you had a different setup, when you were not in the location and you were in a different place, maybe you stayed in Breda Park, you would have been far now in life. And I said to him, yes. So when he, when he, when he mentioned that, a click came into my mind and this thought came when I was around about 14 to 15 years old, I started realizing certain things. And what I realized is that there's no future for me in the sense when if I go, if I finish schooling in matric, I will not be able to go to college. I will not be able to go to university because I'm already aware that my mom was a single parent. My father passed away very young. So my mom was a single parent. She's only working for food. She can only bring food to the table. Mm. So the prospect of me going to a college or to a university and getting a better life 
is not there. And then it's when I chose the life of crime. Mm. And choosing the life of crime is, is the mindset is maybe you can, as you mentioned now, it's not going to happen to me, but I'm looking forward to a sense of a manual breakthrough where I can maybe get some money and yes. try to do some change. Do you understand? So those are the things that lured me up. And, 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 and as I mentioned, the thing when I was speaking outside with you guys, the same thing now is occurring to my son who's 14 years old, not the one who's addicted now. My son was 14 years old. Last year, he just told us he's not going anymore to school. And I looked at him, and I'm like, why not? He said, why for? He said, if I go to school and I go to matric, I'm going to end up sweeping the streets. But why is that? Nisfas will pay for studies now. That's the blessing that you didn't have. I get you. I get you, but we do not have that information. We see it on the TV, but we do not know where to go for it. We don't know how to get to that places. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So that's why I'm saying there's a lack of information. We don't have those types of things. And even when you step up in there, say for instance, now your son or your daughter needs to be a, a, like an intelligent person to get through to certain issues, certain criteria that are set up. Then if my son is an average learner, then he's not able to go there. Do you understand? All these backdrops, so all these things work in a person's mind. But I told him one thing, I said, you're not going to be a criminal, you're not going to be a gangster. But up until this time, he's trying a business of his own. What he's trying to do now is selling some fruits, he's selling some stuff, trying to get some money, but he's helping in the house because he's also seeing there's a lack in the house. What I mentioned to, 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 to Josh and, and to your assistant, I said, the same money that my mom was paying 1996 as a domestic worker is the same money that I'm paying right now as a domestic worker. I'm a cleaner in, in, at a, at a, in, in the plaza in town center. So my mom paid 1996, 3,600 rand. I'm still paying 3,600 rand. What he's saying rand. is like the salary is not going up. You understand? Yeah. Nothing is going, nothing is happening. So my thing that I was telling my, mom, my, 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 my friend here is that we as underprivileged people are being violated from every side and we do not know where to turn to. Nobody's looking after us. Nobody's coming forth to us trying to assist us where we are. We know there are laws that have been stipulated that certain uh, um, criteria of work needs to be paid certain amount of money, but those things are not happening. They're just on the black and white. You know, then you get, um, 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 like, my bosses, my bosses are very good people. Last year, they could not even give us a bonus, or they took it out of their money, mm -hmm. and they gave us a bonus. Why? Because the people they're working for are not giving them maybe an increase. Mm. So there's, there's, there's no certain... So you're kind of saying, like, people join gangs because they don't see the future, right? Hopelessness. Hopelessness. And, and yeah, they right. also just hopelessness, right? And... Um, I think the, the other thing is also a lot of people that come from your areas, I don't know your situation, I don't remember exactly what you said, but um, I know a lot of them come from like one parent homes and uh, a lot of them, uh, maybe the parent was using substances while they were pregnant. So mm. uh, like someone like me, right? Uh, I didn't even finish school and I had like all of these privileges. So it's, it's super difficult for someone that comes from an area like where Tando comes from to to see that future and go, you, you know, there's so many people that need those special needs helps, but they don't get them. Mm. Um, and I certainly got all the help I could, like I could get, and I still couldn't get there, right? Um, so I think basically what, what my next question is just, now that we've established why people join gangs, how do we stop people from joining gangs? How do you stop kids from the kind of ground roots up? What, what is, what is there for the next generation that's gonna change? Or not necessarily that's been in place already, right? Because obviously I know, as uh, the DA doesn't have power over the whole of South Africa, they can't make decisions for the whole of South Africa. Yeah. But um, w if you guys did come into power, or even the things you're doing now, wh what are you guys doing now to, to help kids in those kind of environments? And what will you do uh, if the DA goes into power and has more control? So, the mo I mean, the most important answer to your question is to address what Tando says is the root cause, and that is hopelessness. If you can give people a reasonable prospect that their future can be better, yes. then they will stay in school. They will make better decisions about about their lives because they will see something for for the future. And that's what we are trying to do in Cape Town. That really encapsulates our entire uh, vision and mission in Cape Town is how, how do you give people a real sense that the future is going to be better? Not that you can solve problems instantly overnight, but that you can make progress. You can you can move forward. So when we see, just for example, last week, uh, we got the latest jobs numbers from Stats South Africa. 
Cape Town has created more jobs than all the other, all the other seven major cities in South Africa together. Uh, 250 something thousand new jobs between this time last year and now. Uh, that's 250,000 people, many of whom are in Tando's position or even worse off because they don't even have a, a minimum wage job, who have got work for the very first time ever. Maybe they've, they've been looking for work since high school, since matriculating. They've never got it. And they have it now for the first time. So that's the kind of thing that excites me because those are 250,000 people that see a better future. Their kids see a better future because they can also mm. uh, hopefully get work after, after school. So unemployment here is still 23 or just under 23, 22.5%, I think, now. It's by far the, it's 10 points lower than anywhere else in South Africa, but it's still far too high. If, if this was any other country, 22% unemployment would be a big failure. Would be a big failure in and of itself. So we still have a structural unemployment crisis in our country. It is not being helped by the fact that we, we, we can't get load shedding right. We can't get the trains working. All the fundamental basic services that actually make an economy tick over and absorb people who are desperate for work. None of those things are happening in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So when we talk, you hear me talking in Cape Town about we're obsessed with uh, stopping load shedding. You might think, well, this is just about load shedding. This is just about, uh, you know, middle class people who want to cook, cook dinner or whatever and, and don't like the inconvenience of, of not having a working stove. There's a lot more to it than that. There's a lot more to it. It's actually fundamentally about Tando's story. That's what it's about. It's about making sure that our economy can grow much faster 250,000 could be 500,000, could be 750,000. If we could actually have an economy that, that has the basic fundamentals required to grow. Mm. We don't have that in South Africa because of all of these catastrophic failures. Those are, those are the things that we are trying to address here. Can I quickly interject? Um, I hear the mayor speaking about the jobs, eh? and it's a good initiative that you guys did. But I also want to bring this also to light, you know, in the reality that we're facing. You know, the EPWs, they're giving the three-month contracts. Now, the three-month contracts are like short-term yeah. because at the sense that the person is not working maybe for three years or maybe for five years is mm. not working, then a person gets a contract for three months. And the contract they're getting for three months, the money they're getting for the, for the work that they're doing is just enough to put food on the table and to pay the rent, as I mentioned to Josh and to your assistant, is that where we stay, we stay maybe in one house, then you find that in that one house, there's like five families. Yeah. And in that five families, you find that none of them are working. Do you understand? Because of the lack of employment. But now they're getting these EPW jobs and they're working for these three months and that three months is not enough for him to sustain his family because you understand while he's getting the job, he needs to get to his job. How is he going to get to his job? He doesn't have the money, so he needs to go lend. So now the people of Beza said to you, we are being violated from every area. The people are being violated by people we have a little. They're violating them. And also where we're working is being a violation. So my thing is this. Uh, here in Cape Town, I'm talking now Cape Town, I'm not talking the whole of South Africa. We actually need uh, uh, um, government officials who are investing in taking care of the underprivileged people in fighting for their rights and making them know for their rights are uh, people who will do walk arounds, people who will go to companies who have employed people and get the understanding of what is happening, how much are you paying these people, all these types of stuff. Because at the end of the day, the people work for three months and after three months they're not working and they're not going to work for two years. So where are they going to go again? You're taking out the other people. But let me just correct you. The 250,000 jobs I'm talking about are not EPWP contracts. Okay, cool. These are proper jobs. Cool. These are proper jobs created in the real economy, uh, not government jobs. We, sure. There's no way that we can afford to employ 250,000 people. Cool. The city does an EPWP program, but it employs about you know 25,000 people uh, and on those rotating short-term contracts, mm -hmm. as you say. That is that's the way the law works for EPWP. They're not allowed to be permanent uh, employments. But it's a tiny number. Mm. We are creating jobs in the real economy. In Mitchell's plan, 3,000 3, new uh, jobs at a call center in Mitchell's plan. Uh, Mitchell's plan is increasingly becoming a hub of call center investment in the city, mm -hmm. thanks to the work that we are doing to attract call centers to Cape Town. But I must say, those jobs will overwhelmingly benefit people who have finished school. Mm -hmm. You, the, you, there has to be there has to be both a responsibility of the state to drive economic growth and investment, and a responsibility of 
residents and the public at large to make the decisions that put you in a position to benefit from those opportunities. So in South Africa, there is a huge shortage of jobs for totally unskilled uh, workers who don't who don't have uh, a, a school qualification. There's a huge shortage, and it will be a very very long time before there is job generation in the economy to absorb totally unskilled uh, uh, workers. So when you are bringing call centers, for example, most of those international call center companies will only interview people who have got a metric. Mm. Uh, and then still they've got to do a whole lot more training as well on how to use the computer and how to uh, you know, do all the things they yeah. do in a call center. So there's, it's important that residents put themselves in a position to benefit from a growing economy and the opportunities that brings and not only see the only job opportunity as as uh, EPWP work because that's firstly a tiny number and secondly, as you say, not sustainable. Do you see a South Africa where no one is living in a shack one day? Do you think that is possible? No, I'm afraid not. Uh, I have to be honest with you and, and with your listeners. With the, the government has built 2 million houses since 1994, just over 2 million. And the waiting list is longer now than it was then. Uh, and it's getting longer every day. The waiting list in Cape Town alone is 600,000. Uh, we can build, remember, our, our we build a lot of houses, but it's funded by a national housing grant. Uh, and that grant has been shrinking every year. Uh, our grant now is half what it was 10 years ago. And that's true across the country. Again, those, ch- those choices that national government's making, more salaries, uh, you know, whatever, more VIP protection, more debt, less basics. And that's the choice that we've that, that our national government has made in South Africa. So those grants are declining every year. We've just had another 137 million rand cut from that housing grant. Uh, you may have seen I've, I've, I've tried to make an issue of that publicly because the, the country's in a, in a financial crisis. Instead of cutting the obvious things that we need to cut, They've gone and they've cut things that, that benefit poor people, like mm. like housing grants, mm. unacceptable. Um, so so we will we will carry on building, but at the moment we can build about three thousand units a year in Cape Town. Jeez, I mean, the provincial the, government yeah. does a few more. Maybe they do another three thousand. The provincial government, maybe the national government, they hardly do any. But let's say the national government does another five hundred in Cape Town. So that makes six and a half thousand in total per year. I mean, more people are moving here than. <laughs> That's how many people move here in a month. Not actually more than that. The pe- that's the people we know of that move yeah. here in a month. Yeah. So this is this is. Uh, it's not even like we are running on a treadmill because when you run mm. on a treadmill, you stay in the same place. We mm. are actually moving backwards. Mm. So we've tried to shift focus and say we are not going to get everyone into a free what we what we call RDP house. Mm. That's just not going to happen. Mm. What we've got to focus on is much faster delivery of what we in Cape Town called social housing, which is rental rental apartments. So I've I've really tried to focus my government on the RDP houses will continue to happen in the background, but how do we unlock much faster social housing development uh, where you can get many more thousands of units? People pay for those units. They pay a, a subsidized rental. Uh, but that rental starts at 700 Rand and it goes up to about uh, 4,000, depending on your income. Uh, so that's very affordable. There's many, many hundreds of thousands of Capetonians who would love to live in a place like that, but who can't, there isn't enough available. Mm-hmm. And so we are trying to focus our efforts there rather than in the RDP space. And where are those um, the, uh, units being built or where are those? Flats, yeah. We're using wherever we have big enough parcels of land. So uh, you, you can't do it on a tiny little piece of land. Yeah. You've got to have a certain scale to make it work financially. It can't just be 20 or 30 units. It has to be, you know, probably 200 is the minimum you can you can get away mm-hmm. with to make it work financially. So, uh, I mean, all over the CBD, in Salt River, in uh, we, just next week, we're, we're going to welcome the first tenants at Goodwood Station, at the, at the train station. That's 1,300 units. Uh, really, all wherever we can find big enough parcels of land that we own, we are doing it. What we are saying is we've got, we've got lots of little pieces of land all over the city. There are some massive pieces of land in the city like Aesterplot Air Force Base, Wingfield Army Base, uh, uh, Youngsfield, m- many more that are enormous, that are owned by the national government. 
which we would really like to get hold of. Uh, and we don't need all these army bases and air force bases in, in Cape Town. Or, you know, who knows why we have four or five of them. Uh, so, so that's the kind of argument we're trying to make. Well, the one thing that I was talking about earlier is what, what does the army actually do in South Africa? Well, I mean, some of it is very important work. It's, I think it's two most important jobs at the moment, three. It's fighting in the DRC. It's, it's trying to keep peace in the, in the Eastern DRC. It's fighting Al-Shabaab. They're in the in, Congo. In the Congo, yeah, yeah. They're deployed in the Congo right now. South African mean, military. Yeah, for years they've been. Why there. though? Because there's, a, there's like basically permanent civil war in the Eastern Congo. So and why is that our problem? We are part of this African Union peace force. Uh, and and we are doing the same in, in Mozambique against Al-Shabaab, uh, which is like a terrorist organization in northern Mozambique. And then in the South Africa, they do border on the northern uh, Mozamb- uh, Mozambican and Zimbabwean border. Mm. They do border patrol. That's really the three most important things they do at the moment. Uh, but the, the army in South Africa is tiny and, and, and getting smaller fast. We, it's far too small, actually. And uh, it's... It, it is desperately, desperately short of resources. You know, we don't have any planes that actually work. We have hardly any ships that work. Uh, the The equipment is really poor. So it's tough, but but I have huge respect. There's lots of people from Cape Town, lots of people in the Cape Flats that do go to the army and they have great careers there. Mm. Uh, so I have huge respect for our troops. That's why I mention it is because I know in places like America, um, a lot of people like troubled youth uh, and people that don't really have any o- other options go to the military yep. or the, the, the army um, so that they have a place where they can, first of all, be uh, safe. They get training, they get straightened out, and they kind of, it's it's a, it seems to be like quite a good career path for people that don't know what else to do, right? And that really need structure in their lives. Do you think it would be uh, possible, and this might be a stupid question, but do, do you think it would be a good idea to, start building up the army so that people in places like the Cape Flats, people in places like Kailicha that are maybe living a life like Tando was living, right? Or like his son is currently going through, um, can go and have structure in their life. And then you can use the army and uh, or like the, the military uh, to go into places like Manenberg Absolutely. and the uh, uh, Mitchell's Plain and Kailicha that know the areas and they can be the ones policing those, not necessarily policing, but kind of uh, trying to bring some more order to those areas. So uh, part of what you say I agree with, part I disagree with. Firstly, we have to, we have to build up the, the, the army's capabilities in South Africa. It is just, uh, it's, it's almost becoming embarrassing. It's almost like getting so bad, army experts tell us that we may have to basically shut it down in, in, in the coming years because it just has no resources. Uh, so it's really bad. We've got to build it up. It is a great career path for, for young people. You, you learn great skills, you earn money while you're living on base, you're mm. being looked after, you're getting food and all that. So it's a great career uh, or starting out of your career. Uh, you, you, there's lots of opportunities to study that the, that the army will pay for. So it's brilliant. Uh, we, we have to build it up. I don't believe that the army should do policing, like ordinary day-to-day policing, okay. because the army is trained to kill people. That's, that's literally their training. That's literally their job description. So they are, they, you know, you don't want people like that policing your streets because something's going to go horribly wrong. Yeah. It's important that they intervene in crisis situations like they have before in, in Mannenberg and elsewhere. Mm. But that's just very short, a week or two weeks, and then you, you want them out. Uh, but here's the thing. We are currently – so the trouble is the, the army is not hiring. They're not recruiting. Uh, I, I get – every public meeting I go to on the Cape Flats, literally everyone, I get people approaching me, asking me for help to get their kids into the army. And we help where we can to, to put in a good word with the Navy or, or lots of people want to go to Simonstown to the Navy in Cape Town. Uh, but, the, the, you know, if you're only hiring 100 people, there's just... There's just few. not enough space. What I'd really love is for people from the Cape Flats to join law enforcement and join Metro Police, where we hire many more people. We're about to, in two weeks' time, on the 12th of December, we're about to open intake for 1,000 new officers. Uh, and they, you know, those officers get a full nine month proper basic training course. They get firearms training. They get, uh, uh, you know, proper discipline training. They, they come out of their proper law enforcement officers or Metro police officers. It's exactly the same training that police officers get actually. So I really encourage people to apply for that. 
you'll, you'll, you'll be amazed, Josh and, and Tando, that very often we open the doors for a big law enforcement intake and uh, you'll hard, you won't find enough applicants from the Cape Flats. Uh, That's very surprising because it it's quite. It's quite. Yeah. From what I've heard, it's, it's it, a great job. It pays quite well. It does, and there's a lot of benefits for when you retire as well, right? Good pension, good medical aid. Uh, you know, it's it's a great. I think it's a great uh, a great career. So I really encourage people. We, we're about to open the doors in a couple of weeks. Amazing. Can I can I just ask something? If not asking, just just to add something. Mm. Um, utilize or. Utilize the, 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 the frequent places by people. Yeah, the libraries and shops. And place that information there. The reason why you're getting such few intakes is because many of the, of the, of the opportunities are digital. Now, many people where I am, as, as Josh mentioned, no Wi-Fi, no kinds of stuff. Mm. They don't even have data to keep on WhatsApp. You understand. So those types of things, what I'm trying to say, when, when, when you think in that span, don't just think where you know. Think also where you don't know, under, in the sense of we know paper is, is going away because we're in a digital place now, but bring in the paper also. Send in the flyers, put mm. on the plan. Post it everywhere. Post yeah. it so that people can know mm. because I'm telling you, many kids, they, they want to become policemen. Mm. They want to become law enforcement, law enforcement yeah. but it's just the information. You know, I, I was speaking one day, I'm saying, you know, people, I was speaking with my cousin, telling him I'm going to do this with you, and he said, please tell the mayor this. Tell him that they must not speak about us, they must speak to us. Mm. So I want to kind of just skip over <laughs> to the elections, right? Because I know we're running out yeah, of time here. But um, how have the registrations gone so far with the elections? I know they just opened up this week, right? Th this weekend was a national registration weekend, yes. yeah. And how did they go so far? The indications that we've seen are, are, are quite positive. Obviously, you've got to do some detailed analysis about uh, what were the age of the people that registered, where did they register, so on. So we, we're still working through those numbers. But from the initial evidence we've seen, it looks like some younger people registered, more than usual. That's encouraging to it see. It said 78% of new registrations were citizens aged 16 to 29. Yeah, so that's that's super, obviously. That's really encouraging because usually that category is just not interested at, at all. Uh, then it looks like uh, you know the the a lot of people came to DA uh, tables uh, at the at the registration weekend, so that also looks positive. Mm. Uh, so yeah, we've got six months to go. We'll see, but but early indications are positive. And why do you think the ANC has been able to hold power for so long? I mean, it's kind of getting ridiculous in a way that it's. It, Nothing has changed in South Africa. Well, no, a lot has changed. It's got a lot worse, right? Things are just going backwards. Mm. Why do you think people are so set on keeping the ANC in power? Why have they stayed in power for so long? Well, I think the, the ANC support is collapsing. Uh, it's really falling off a cliff. Uh, so I, I don't think that that will be the case for much longer. But the ANC is a very durable political brand. It is probably the most famous political brand in the whole planet. Uh, it's, you know, it, it, it had one of the most famous people in history as its president. It, uh, there's a whole lot of, of still emotional connection with lots of people because of its role in, in uh, apartheid. So th that takes a long time to wear off. And this is very common, by the way, in, in post-liberation democracies. If you look at India, if you look at Mexico, uh, you, you see all of these post-liberation countries, you see that the party of liberation takes a long time to, to, to fall apart, but it always does. It always does. In Zambia, the party of uh, Kenneth Kuanda, take a guess what that party gets today in Zambian elections. 2%. 1%. 1%. The, you know, Kenneth Kuanda was the Nelson mm -hmm. Mandela of Zambia. Mm -hmm. uh, the, so I, I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever that the ANC will go the same way uh, I think probably in all of our lifetimes, uh, Josh and Tando, we will see the ANC as a as a minority party in South Africa because it has messed up so shockingly. It has messed up beyond beyond a disgrace, and so many people are paying the price for that in their lives and and uh, lost opportunities. So, but it 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 does take time. The longest I think Mexico was the longest, which took seventy years, seven zero for the party of liberation to be kicked out of office. Uh, India was very quick. I think I think South Africa will be the quickest yet. 
uh, it's either going to happen in May or, or they might just, just, just hang on to it, but uh, it'll be their last time. And so, what's the goals? What What is the DA's goal for the 2024 elections? A political party's goal is always to grow. It must be. Uh, it's uh, a bit like, you know, you've got to move forward. The our ultimate goal, obviously, is to put together a coalition government that can unseat the ANC mm. and that can put together a new government for South Africa. It's going to be very touch and go as to whether that's possible in this election. A lot is going to turn out uh, turn on how many people register to vote and how many people actually come out to vote on election day mm. to vote for one of the moonshot packed parties and and uh, hopefully most importantly for the DA. Uh, so th I think those are two most important goals. That's what we have to do to save South Africa. Um, okay. Speaking about the percentage of the 16 to 29, because me and Joshua were speaking right now about the elections, I've never voted in South Africa. Reason why I don't trust politicians. Reason why I don't trust politicians is because of their conduct. The conduct of the politician is like this. We see you when you're campaigning. And after that, we don't see you. You know, the only people that can win the election from the ANC is people who will be able to come down and mingle with the people on and off campaign times. Be there to assist the people. The people are not trusting. The people look at you guys and they see you there and they say like, yeah, I, he, this is I'm going to say in Afrikaans, I come now, meaning he's coming now, we will not see him again. Mm. Do you understand? He's only coming to get the votes and when he got the vote, then he's gone. Then we won't see him, no changes whatsoever will come to us. So the only party that can win now from the ANC is the party that is willing to get his hurts dirty. Mm. Come down to the people, mingle with the people, invest your time, be with the people, assist the people where they need to be assisted. Do you understand? Open up spots like I'm, I'm, I'm serving under a great man. I think you know him because he also goes there. He's in the ACDP, um, George Page. Mm -hmm. You know, he's my apostle in that I'm serving under him in church. He has even allowed his house to become an office for the ACDP where people can come and ask for assistance, paralegal assistance, what can, you know, a, a go-to place. Mm. And from that, he's even opened up a, a, an office. He's got now an office opposite his house. So we don't see that from the ANC. We don't see that from the DA. We don't see that. Do you understand? So mingle, be with the people. So let me just say a, a, a couple of things. Firstly, the on not voting. Whether you vote or not, people are going to be elected into government and are going to make decisions. Yes, sir. They're just going to make decisions without your voice being heard in yes, that decision. Sir. So you have to vote in South Africa. It's, it's really important to be involved in the political process. Politics will carry on I hear without, you. without your vote. Yeah. So, but you are going to have to deal with the consequences of those All decisions those that you don't like. So you have to be involved. Uh, this is my message to every young South African. I understand that young South Africans are, uh, feel you know, more interested in TikTok or whatever than voting, but I'm telling you, politics is very interested in their lives. Mm -hmm. Secondly, let me challenge you, Tando. Yes, sir. This is one of the criticisms I hear every day. Every single uh, month since I've been elected, I go do at least two public meetings around the city a month, I do at least uh, first Thursdays every single month. Uh, at least once a month, I go to uh, to a meeting of residents or ratepayers that they call me to that we don't arrange. I'm in Mitchell's Plain at least every week, possibly more often than that. Every Since the very first public meeting, people said, oh, now it's just after the election, so we're seeing him now. Mm. We're not going to see him again until the next election. Now it's two years later, they're saying, oh, it's it's just before the next election, so that's why he's coming now. Then we won't see him uh, afterwards. I've been doing it every single month since yeah. since the election. So let me also challenge you, Tando. We are out there. We are out there. We are on Facebook. We are in communities. We have got offices in Mitchell's Plain. We've got an office at Town Centre. We've got uh, councillors there in every ward. They've got offices there. They are everywhere. We are sending out communication. 
It's also your responsibility to engage in the political process and not to say every time you see someone just because it's a year away or two years away from an election, oh, that's why they, that's why we're seeing them now. Mm-hmm. That's also part of your responsibility as a citizen. Yeah. You will see that the engagement is happening constantly, constantly, constantly. Uh, but it does. it is a two-way relationship. It's a partnership, citizenship. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a give and take. So... I think the problem is people aren't being inspired to take place. Where, like, you say you go into the communities and that kind of stuff, but it's, I find it very sad when the Springboks can, you know, uplift and get people so much more motivated than our politicians can. And I think it's because people... It's, I'm just so also sick of hearing politicians using jargon. And it's just like, just speak as a person. Mm. We don't need someone going, the RDP, the, you know what I mean? Just go in and speak to people like they're people. And I think that's why when it comes to like the spring box, right? We look at them almost like the saviors of our country, which is so freaking sad that a rugby team has to be that for us, right? I mean, I've never seen South Africans so positive and so united um, as when they won the 2019 and the 2023 World Cup, right? How can we get people to go, I'm going to rock with the DA or I'm going to rock with the ANC? How can we go? I mean, I see it, I see it at the FF rallies. They're going crazy. <laughs> but how can you get people to be excited about the process? Mm. Because why should someone want to go? Like you say, you go to the communities, right? Um, but it's like, what, are, you just, are people just talking? Like, what, what is going on? How do you get people to go, I really want to be interested in politics? Because even me, I'm not, I wasn't interested until I started this, this podcast. And then I, I know how important it is, right? But how can you go get people to go, I really want to be part of this because it looks like it's going to really benefit me. Mm. And the, the, the person that I want to support is actually going to get into power and make real changes and not just go, it was the we can't do anything because it's the people that came before us that kind of messed everything up. So now we can't do anything. Mm. You know, we're, we're we're suffering from the ills of our past. I don't think uh, any politician is ever going to get the public excited as as excited as the Springboks, and that's probably a good thing, by the way. You don't want politicians to be cults of personality. You want politicians to actually be public servants. P- politicians should not be. Uh, you know, whipping up crowds into frenzies of, no, of not emotion, frenzies, yeah. like like uh, like we see the one, the one party that you yeah. mentioned. Uh, I think that's kind of almost dangerous in a democracy. Mm. Uh, it's great to to kind of worship our rugby team. I, I, you know, I, that's fine, but we shouldn't be doing that with with any people uh, who are st- who are public servants. But let me again, there are lots of people interested in the political process. They are our public meetings are are. Are fully packed. Uh, we we we've got hundreds of people coming every week to to our meetings. We've got thousands of people mm-hmm. engaging on social media. It's not it's not always going to be possible to cover everyone, but all the opportunities to engage are out there. They really are out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got we've got councillors in every single ward. We've got branches, branch committees. You name it. We do have to. Residents have also got to find those opportunities to plug in. I think just to end off, right? I know you need to go. If the DA becomes the government of South Africa, right? Do you think we will be in a better position than we are now? Cheaper, so unbelievably so. Unbelievably so. If we if we could get this economy growing at five percent a year, which I absolutely believe is possible. At the moment, it's growing at less than one percent. And even that is frankly miraculous that we even can get, let's say, 1% rounded up to be generous, 1% growth in a place where we can't even have electricity for six hours of the day. If you can get that economy growing at 4 or 5%, you will create hundreds of thousands of new work opportunities each year. That brings more resources to the state. That allows you to do more things for those who really need it more hospitals, more better schools, fewer kids in each class. Everything comes down to this, everything. This is not, it's not possible to solve the, the problems in our country without a growing economy. Let's just be absolutely frank about that. When the, when the state has got no money to, to, to provide options for Tando's son other than just having to expel him, because the teacher, I feel sorry for the teacher, how can the teacher do anything else when they've got 45 kids in the class? Yeah. There's one bad kid, 
They've got to get rid of it. I mean, I went to the new in the schools there when I was telling you about that program. Yeah. There was one teacher for three classes yeah. of 50 kids a class. Come on. So all of this comes down to the, the, the state of our country's economy. Mm. If, we, if we can grow our economy, get people more hope for the future, more resources for the state, you can do much more for the poor. That is what the DA is about. That's what we're obsessed with doing. That is what we are trying to do on a, on a city scale, not on a national scale, on a city scale in Cape Town. And we are showing that it is possible. Unemployment is coming down. Violent crime is coming down. Are those things still too high? Of course they're still too high. But they are heading in the right direction, not in the wrong direction. Whereas in South Africa, unfortunately, every one of those numbers is heading in the wrong direction. And we should be deeply, deeply concerned uh, and afraid for the future if that doesn't stop. But it can, can be turned around. I deeply believe that. And that's what we're trying to show here. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. I, I had so much more to talk about. I wish we had more time, but um, we can maybe do this again in the future. But uh, I'd love that. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Tando, for coming on. Thank you. It's thank really Tando, that was a great conversation. Thank you very much, Josh, and, and of course, the listeners. It's a pleasure. And thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Wide Awake Podcast. I'll see you all very soon. Cheers.